Welcome to the Mental Wellbeing Show, where we take a deep dive into the wonderful world of psychology and mental wellbeing. So, Dr. Sarah Williams, thank you for joining me on the Mental Wellbeing Show. Oh, you're very welcome. It's great to be here. I'm excited for, for this one to discuss um, anxiety, all things anxiety with you. Um, even just reading through your research, uh, Sarah, as I was saying, it's had a pretty big impact on my own relationship with anxiety. So to be able to kind of um, dive into that in more detail is, um, yeah, very exciting. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a topic I always enjoy talking about. And I think it's a topic that um, most people I talk to about uh, find it quite interesting. And it, it's really applicable to, to not just sport, but I guess everyday life, we always experience stress and anxiety. So I think it's got a lot of application. Yeah, definitely. And I think there'll be a lot of key takeaways for, for people listening. Um, what I wanted to, to start with you is um, to kind of frame the conversation around some, some kind of key terms, just I think will help kind of everyone understand, you know, what is to come. So particularly, you focus a lot on um, the differences in, in cognitive and somatic anxiety. So perhaps we could start there and um, yeah, what that difference is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, when, whenever we're anxious, we always experience different types of symptoms. And these, you know, can differ between people, but there's, there's a lot of overlap. And we tend to classify these symptoms into either being cognitive anxiety symptoms or somatic anxiety. So cognitive anxiety is much more to do with the, the mental component, as they say. It's the sort of the nervous thoughts, the worries, the concerns about performing poorly or maybe failing in that situation. Whereas somatic anxiety um, is with regards to the sort of physiological symptoms that you might have when you're feeling anxious. So that might be things like maybe feeling sort of butterflies in the stomach, maybe sweaty palms, increases in heart rate, maybe sort of a, a shallow or a faster breathing rate, that type of thing. And it's, well, I know from my own personal experience, um, I feel like I, I differ in the levels of experience or the levels of symptoms rather uh, between somatic and cognitive anxiety. So they can kind of occur at different levels within people. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, they vary in terms of their levels between people they often vary as well for somebody with maybe one type of situation compared to another. Somebody might have, uh, you know, maybe if it's like a presentation or something, potentially they might have sort of more negative concerns. Whereas maybe if they're taking part in a, an event they're a bit more comfortable about, maybe they'll still be experiencing anxiety, but potentially you know, maybe it's more somatic, um, thinking about sporting events, that type of thing. Uh, and we know from the literature as well that in the lead up to stressful scenarios, our anxiety manifests in, in slightly different ways. So what typically tends to happen when we have an upcoming um, event, so there's been, been work done with athletes looking in the lead up to a, a competition, our cognitive anxiety tends to start earlier on. So maybe in that week leading up to the competition, that's when maybe athletes start to feel a little bit anxious. Uh, and what we see is that typically the somatic anxiety doesn't tend to kick in until much closer to the event. So in particular, maybe the night before and, and definitely on the morning of that competition. So not only do the, the types of anxiety differ between people, but the intensities of those different types of anxiety can really differ within us, ourselves, in the lead up to a stressful scenario. Mm, I can certainly certainly relate to that. And when I think of anxiety provoking situations, um, particularly public speaking is one that comes to mind. But one of the things that um, I took away from your research, Sarah, was that before reading your research, my impression was that anxiety is categorically bad. but Upon reading your research, it, it appears that, you know, that's very much not the case. So can you perhaps um, tell us a little bit about why it's more nuanced than that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's really sort of what I'm very uh, interested in as a, as a researcher. And it, it very much came from my own experiences playing sport. Um, and I noticed that sometimes I would experience what I considered anxiety and, and not play so well. And other times um, I'd experience anxiety, but, but maybe perform actually better than I would at a training. And through talking to other people, you know, this was like years and years ago, finding out that they experienced similar things and then looking more in more depth at the research. Um, but actually, when you when you look at elite athletes, when they talk, often there's signals there that suggest that anxiety doesn't have to necessarily be a bad thing and can be a, a good thing. Um, and it's this idea that, you know, stress and anxiety were from an evolutionary point of view designed to help us perform. You know, that, that heart rate speeding up is designed not to panic us, but it's designed to pump blood, oxygen, nutrients to our muscles to be able to, to perform well or to our brain if we're needing to make you know, important decisions in that in that exam, for example. 
um, you know, the narrowing of the attention and only being able to focus on that event isn't to worry us. It's so that we don't get distracted by other things so that, that we can perform. Um, and so although it's not perhaps widespread, there is the evidence in the literature and there's anecdotal reports when you listen to athletes talking. They almost need that anxiety. They need that kick to really fuel them to perform and to perform better under those moments of pressure. So this is the, the concept of anxiety is facilitative versus debilitative. Is that right? Absolutely. It's this idea. It's not so much the intensity of the anxiety that we're experiencing. It's how we perceive that anxiety that seems to be important. Um, you know, and, and you hear it often with, with athletes. So Andy Murray's a really nice example of tennis. Um, he used to talk a lot about nerves, particularly when he was at Wimbledon. You know, the British media would put a lot of pressure on him, uh, wanting him to win. And, and they would say to him, you know, you know, there's a lot of pressure on you. You know, how are you coping with that? And he would talk about the idea that actually I do feel nervous, but the nerves are good. The nerves mean I care. The nerves mean I'm going to focus. I'm going to concentrate. I'm going to perform that a little bit better. Um, you've got other athletes who experience similar symptoms, but they don't necessarily call, refer to them as nerves or anxiety. So a really nice example of that was um, David Beckham, who's now obviously retired. Um, but when he used to play, he used to talk about the idea, you know, I never got nervous before a game. I got excited. But often the feelings of excitement that he was experiencing and that he would describe are very similar to the experiences or the symptoms that somebody else would think is anxiety and is a, is a negative thing. So it's not so much the, the symptoms, it's how we perceive those symptoms and, and use those to, to fuel our performance. Yeah, it's, it's unheard of, at least in my own world, you know, whenever I think or, or the, the vernacular in my social circles is if I am anxious, that's interchangeable with, you know, something is wrong and I need to, to fix that. I need to reduce that anxiety. And it's, yeah, again, it's categorically bad. Um, but I wonder if that's, you know, media, social media, what the influences there are, but it's certainly been the case in my own world. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely ingrained in society. And, and that's something I talk to people about. When somebody says to somebody, you know, I'm feeling stressed or I'm feeling anxious, often the other person's response is, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. Is it, What can I do to help? Um, and, and you're right. It, it's, it's just ingrained in society that, that stress is bad, anxiety is bad. But actually the evidence there to, to show us the complete opposite. You know, when I'm talking to, to my students at, at the university, um, and they have an upcoming deadline until that deadline gets a little bit closer and until they feel a little bit more nerves and anxiety they you know, they're not motivated to to perform so that in itself i, I talk to them and say <clears throat> you know that you know you need that anxiety you need a little bit of stress a little bit of anxiety to motivate you to drive you to to make sure that you, you focus and this really came out um in one of your papers um i'm going to forget the title so let me read it off 2016 study Anxiety Symptom Interpretation, a Potential Mechanism Exploring the Cardiorespiratory Fitness-Anxiety Relationship. And that relationship between fitness and anxiety, and in particular that kind of mediator which explained that, was, yeah, really fascinating. Yeah, so the, the idea with that study really came about um, when we feel stressed and when we feel anxious, we tend to experience physiological sensations, increases in heart rate, increases in, in breathing um, you know when we feel or when we engage in physical activity and exercise we often engage in similar responses increases in heart rates you know increases in breathing that type of thing and it was really this idea that can we or, or can people use exercise or physical activity as a way to almost experience what some would consider somatic anxiety experience those sensations but associate them with something completely different and it's that idea that when we get stressed, we experience these responses. If we can associate those responses with something more positive or, or something that's not a negative, um, can we then change how people feel when they become anxious? So that was the idea with what we were thinking with why we thought potentially the anxiety interpretation could, could mediate that relationship. With the idea being if people are more physically active, they experience somatic symptoms it's not as a result of feeling anxious but it's as a result of being physically active so when they experience those when they're feeling anxious they don't necessarily see them as a really negative thing because the body's almost more accustomed to them without without necessarily realizing it and by experiencing more positive interpretations of that anxiety it's likely that it's going to be perceived to be um, less severe 
So is that is the mechanism their habituation to the symptoms or is it the interpretation of the symptoms or is it like a combination of both? Because the two seem slightly different in my head at least. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I don't think we, we fully know. I, I think the idea with it is that by experiencing symptoms that will be reflective of anxiety in a different context, like being physically active, you become more used to them. They don't become as fearful. So a lot of the time, if we think about it in um, clinical settings, panic attacks, anxiety disorders, you know, quite a lot of the time that gets worse when we start or when the person starts experiencing symptoms. So it's the idea that, okay, I feel my heart racing now. I've got a decision to make here. Either this is a you know, fear, it's panic, it's going to trigger me to, to negatively spiral, or it's a case saying, okay, oh, I've got an elevation in heart rate here. That must mean I'm switched on, I'm ready to perform, or you know, it might mean something, something completely different. So it, it's that idea of trying to retrain ourselves in how we respond to those symptoms that we're, we're experiencing. And it's thought that something through... Um, not just exercise, but other types of, of training, so imagery training, reappraisal training, we can teach the person to change the beliefs about what they are experiencing. So we experience the response. It's our beliefs about that response that are likely to then trigger our subsequent responses and, and whether we respond in a positive way or whether we respond in a, in a negative way. Okay. And do you think then that... So I've seen a lot of research looking at um, exercise as a potential treatment for mood disorders, for anxiety, you know, it has, seems to have these kind of anxiolytic um, effects, but not much research kind of confirming what the mechanisms behind that are. Do you think that this is a potential mechanism for the anxiolytic effects of, of exercise? I do. I think potentially, and there has been a little bit of work um, done in, in sort of more clinical populations with the idea of this, what they refer to as anxiety sensitivity. And by being more physically active, um, when you experience anxiety, it's less of a, a negative response. So you don't see it as being such a, a negative thing. And, and again, it sort of stops that, that negative spiral of, you know, oh my goodness, my heart is racing. Oh my goodness, now I can't breathe. Oh my, you know, and you just start to talk yourself up and you start to um, focus in on those symptoms as being a really negative thing rather than the positives that, that a little bit of stress and a little bit of anxiety can serve. And we do know in the literature that, um, when you see something as the anxiety is being negative, often that then panics you and you experience it even more so. So it can also increase the, the intensity of the anxiety even more. So again, that, that sort of negative spiral. And this kind of idea that beliefs can really change our experience of things. So in this case, anxiety, it seems like this is kind of generalized across a number of other different contexts as well. So I know um, I came across it through your research, looking at like Alita Crumb's work on stress optimization, but also on, have you seen her, the milkshake study? Have you seen that one that, that she's done? Yeah. So it really all comes back to this idea of sort of mindsets um, and we can have different mindsets in, in different domains, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, in terms of a, a stressful scenario, a stress mindset, it's thought that that can be, be really key. Uh, so very similar to anxiety, it's very much your perceptions of stress. Do you think of stress as being um, beneficial? So that's more of a, a stress is enhancing mindset. Or do you see stress as being a really negative, detrimental thing? And so that would be somebody who has a more stress is debilitating mindset. So given given this and given the kind of um, the significance of this, do you, do you know how people can go about effectively changing their belief systems? Because it, it all seems so very empowering that if we can change our belief systems, we can change our, our, our physiology, in some cases, our actual real world experience of anxiety. How can people go about implementing this? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. And, and, and what's so great about our beliefs is we can change them. So, you know, we all have beliefs about different things. So if we take stress, for example, that's often been shaped by maybe the media, the people around us, um, our own experiences, but we can therefore change it. Um, now, if, if we are very set on a particular uh, belief because of maybe a number of different experiences we've had, if we've had very negative experiences during stress, for example, we might be very, very set on stress is very negative. So as an individual, we might be, it might be harder to change our belief, 
but we do know that our stress mindset is malleable um, and we can do it in different ways. And, and one of the key ways is actually education. So a lot of the time, a bit like we were talking about earlier, instinctively, we just think stress is bad, anxiety is bad. Um, we don't necessarily know why that's the case, but that tends to be what we think. So just by educating people about why we get responses when we're stressed, why we experience these anxiety responses, um, the fact that they are from an evolutionary point of view designed to help us, if you combine that with then also evidence, you know, scientific evidence of people performing better under conditions of stress and anxiety, um, and also using anecdotal reports, you know, so it's great to look and pick apart quotes from athletes or you know other other people in the media about the beneficial effects of stress or the fact that it doesn't have to be detrimental that can really just open somebody's eyes to the potential of stress um, and and that can really begin to change how they view stress and there's been studies in the literature that have shown that even a three minute video just educating somebody about the benefits of stress can change their their stress mindset Um, obviously more work needs to be done in terms of is that sustained? Does that take a bit of a dent if somebody then does get stressed and doesn't perform as well as they would have wanted to? Um, but at the same time, there's also really positives that can come about from that. So if you can change someone's mindset and they do suddenly perform a little bit better next time they're stressed, that's then only going to add to that positive mindset and help strengthen that more positive mindset. Um, so it's definitely something we can we can change and there's, there's different techniques that we can use to, to do that. So I mentioned um, earlier, Sarah, that reading through your research, you know, you've already had a big impact on the way that, you know, I manage anxiety in my everyday life. But one of the things since I've been trialing out and trying to implement this kind of anxiety is facilitating mindset and really change my beliefs about it is the, the question and the doubt comes to my mind is where do I draw the line? Because, you know, in some cases, anxiety can be debilitating and stress can be debilitating. So how do we yeah, draw the line so that it's a positive but functional relationship with anxiety? Yeah, it's a great question. And I don't think there is a, a perfect answer. I think it's about understanding that it can be beneficial and, and really getting, you know, acknowledging the fact that, okay, actually sometimes we get stressed and it doesn't quite go to plan. Um, but, you know, any beliefs we have about the potential of stress of it being a good thing so even if it's just things like look you know a deadline next week adds a little bit more stress compared to a deadline in three months time so that in itself might make me focus a bit more okay that that might be a good thing so seeing the opportunities or seeing the situations when we do perform better under stress um, is is going to is going to help what we also find is that by simply having that more positive view about stress or just accepting that it, it actually can be beneficial for us at certain times that in some ways can also make a negative scenario seem less daunting. Because if we go in with the mindset of stress is awful, I'm just going to be horrifically bad, um, that's going to have much more negative consequences than the idea of, okay, actually, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to it, but because of that stress, I've prepared a little bit more than I would have done normally. So I already know I'm going to perform better than I could have done if I hadn't prepared anything at all. So it's, it's clinging to the positives that can help stress be less detrimental. And the more strategies we have to cope with stress, we can also obviously lower some of our stress and anxiety. It's about identifying what is the sort of optimal level for us as individuals, because that's naturally going to vary and that might differ depending on the scenarios. Um, But I see seeing stress more positively as almost just like an extra tool in our armory. You know, there might be other things we do to help us feel less stressed and anxious on the day but actually seeing it more positively is going to help with that as well. And what we find by people changing their views on stress naturally, their stress and anxiety does reduce somewhat just because they appreciate the benefits that it has helped them maybe prepare or maybe it helps them focus a little bit more on the day. Have you seen the implication of this or rather the application of this in clinical settings? Because um, right now I'm going through postgraduate training to be a, a psychologist here in Australia. And we do a lot of CBT work, but it feels like the implicit assumption throughout all my training is that anxiety is bad. Let's reduce it as much as possible with a bunch of different you know, strategies, right? Have you, have you seen the application of changing anxiety mindsets or anxiety direction or interpretation in clinical populations? 
myself, I've not done any work in clinical settings just yet. Um, and I think that the the tendency in clinical settings is still very much the idea that, you know, stress and anxiety is, is a negative. And, and, and quite often for those people with sort of a clinical diagnosis of anxiety or something like that, then um, simply telling somebody stress and anxiety can be positive isn't going to, to solve, you know, their anxiety. It's not going to change their, their anxiety necessarily. Um, but I think it does come into this idea of just changing our beliefs slightly in terms of anxiety. So a bit like what I was saying earlier about sometimes when we experience elevations in heart rate or when we suddenly experience a symptom of anxiety or stress, that can sometimes trigger that negative spiral of like, oh my goodness, I'm starting to have a panic attack. Oh my goodness, everything's going wrong. And, and we start catastrophizing and it becomes a bigger thing. Um, we make it a bigger thing. We experience then much more elevated symptoms. Um, so by simply helping some of those patients see stress and anxiety as it's almost a, a choice to make in terms of I experience the elevations now, obviously I don't necessarily want these responses, but how I view those responses can influence whether or not I experience a, a negative spiral or not. Um, so using a stress mindset and, and educating them about some of the benefits of stress and anxiety can almost help them see it as less of a terrible thing and through some of those other cbt training techniques it, again it's part of a collection of of lowering their anxiety lowering their stress symptoms lowering anything that sort of or lowering the likelihood of things triggering those responses but that can sort of contribute to helping them um prevent having those sort of panic attacks or those those negative elevations in anxiety and so i think it's that idea of, of like i said earlier um it can be beneficial it's not always necessarily beneficial, particularly for, for people with sort of clinical anxiety diagnoses, when it's not so much about a specific event that they're, they're leading it to. But I think it can it can help with um, more acute bouts of, of anxiety. Um, so if we're thinking about fears or phobias, um, maybe changing their beliefs about some of the responses they're experiencing in response to those fears or phobias can prevent them having a, a negative um, Kind of tackle or spiral more. I wanted to change tack a little bit. Um, look at some of your work on confidence and self efficacy and the relationship between that and our experiences of stress. Can you talk us through uh, the relationship between those two uh, elements and yeah, the relationship to our experience of stress? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this comes down to again how we how we view stress or, or how we appraise a stressful situation. So. When we think about stress more positively, we can either have that, that stress mindset view of stress can be a, a positive thing for us, but we can also appraise specific situations in a more adaptive way. And this comes down to this idea of, of what we call challenge and threat. So if we have a stressful scenario where we see it as more of a challenge, that means that we acknowledge it's stressful or it's demanding, but we perceive that we have it within ourselves, the resources to meet the demands of that situation. And through that, it's thought that we're going to respond more adaptively, we're going to cope more proactively and, and, and likely experience more positive emotions and perform better. If in that same scenario, we feel it's, it's too demanding for us, we don't have the sufficient resources to meet the demands of that situation, we're likely to appraise that scenario as a threat. And following a threat appraisal, it's thought that we'll respond more maladaptively. So we'll experience more negative responses um, and we'll likely perform more poorly in that situation. So it all comes down to this way up between what are the demands of the situation? What am I being asked to do? And what are my perceived resources? Do I feel capable of meeting those demands? And what we find is that our self-confidence, our self-efficacy in that situation is likely to be one of the strongest predictors of whether or not we feel we have the resources to meet those demands. So as an individual, if I'm somebody with high levels of, of efficacy and, and feel very confident in myself, I'm more likely to feel I've got those resources to meet the demands. So the idea here really is that if we can boost people's self-efficacy, boost their confidence in those stressful scenarios, it's likely that they're going to appraise them more as a challenge and therefore respond more adaptively than if they are experiencing low levels of, of confidence or efficacy see it as a threat and respond more maladaptively. And you use um, imagery techniques as, as quite an um, effective tool to, to boost that confidence and self-efficacy. 
Yes. So a lot of my work really revolves around trying to change how we appraise these scenarios, see them as, as more of a challenge. And so um, because self-efficacy is, is such a key um, antecedent of that resource demand way up, should we say, um, trying to really just boost their self-efficacy and their, their confidence of being able to cope and perform really well in, in those stressful situations. And, and not just really self-efficacy, but also um, perceived control, because the literature suggests feeling efficacious, but also feeling in control of that stressful situation is likely to lead to more of a challenge. So we really try and um, give imagery scripts to people that are going to help them experience more self-efficacy and a greater level of perceived control over an upcoming stressful scenario. It's my understanding in, in reading through your papers that it's not just any type of imagery. It has to be a specific type that, or there's a specific type that lends itself better to improving our confidence and self-efficacy. Can you talk us through perhaps, you know, the, I think the positive mastery imagery is what you called it? Yes. Yeah, so, so I think, um, you know, the, fir the first thing if you're working with someone is to, to really identify, you know, what, what works well for them, because for some people, maybe it might be something slightly different. We know with imagery, it can be more effective if it, if it is individualized. Um, but we have found, um, repeatedly with different populations that this this idea of what we refer to as, as mastery imagery seems to work really well um, or, or more of a sort of a challenge appraised imagery and it's the idea that we want people to acknowledge that things aren't always perfect you know we experience stress we experience difficult situations and in those situations we experience elevations in heart rate we expect you know we experience symptoms cognitive and somatic anxiety but those responses are very much designed to fuel us. So we use the imagery scripts to try and help the individuals connect those responses with them being prepared to perform well, them being adamant that despite maybe things not always going to plan, they are still going to perform well. So really try and use the imagery scripts to help them feel confident and feel in control in a stressful situation, with the idea being that um, we're, we're retraining them really to associate elevations in heart rates, maybe butterflies in the stomach, as being positive things that are going to help me perform. This means I'm ready. This means I'm switched on. This means I'm focused at that moment in time. With the idea being that if they feel confident and in control when they're experiencing those symptoms in an imagery scenario, the idea is that hopefully when they then come to experience an actual scenario and they experience those symptoms and responses, they're going to automatically connect that with being confident, being in control and being ready to perform. That feels like it's come full circle, right? You're almost retraining those kind of beliefs that anxiety is facilitative. Yeah, it's, it's very much about the anxiety being facilitated and even just the, the responses. So even if people don't necessarily refer to it as anxiety, just really trying to associate when my heart rate increases before an important competition, it is because I'm getting in the zone. I'm, you know, oh, I'm, I can feel it now. I'm, I'm, I'm awake, I'm ready to perform. I'm, I'm getting, you know, my body is waking up and it's getting ready to perform. One of the things, um, Sarah, that's really come out through this conversation and really reflecting on reading through your research is that anxiety is not only is it not categorically negative, but it's it's almost inextricably linked to anything meaningful that I've done, you know, in, in my life. And you know, there's been an element of that. So it has changed my relationship, not in this, in the sense that I no longer look at just reducing anxiety, but almost trying to harness it and really make it work and understand that there are some pretty big benefits to come from this. You know, you look at like post-traumatic growth literature, for example, that feels very relevant to this as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, a lot of the time people think, well, you know, how can certain things be um positive for us how can certain negative experiences that are very stress evoking or very anxiety evoking be, be positive things but but like you say even scenarios where people might think there's surely nothing good can come of that people can still experience positive outcomes as a result of a very negative stress evoking experience um, and so and it, it comes back to that idea of trying to appreciate that actually um, stress and anxiety is designed to help us we might not like the scenario that we are experiencing, but the stress and the anxiety we experience with that is designed very much to, to help us. It's not designed to hinder us. Our bodies, from an evolutionary point of view, are always trying to survive. Um, and we're always trying to, um, you know, the idea is to, to help people 
see the anxiety as being something to help us thrive in those situations rather than just surviving. It's designed to thrive. And again, coming back to, to athlete scenarios, the, the number of them that talk about the idea of wanting to get into the zone, feeling hyped up, feeling prepared, a lot of that is just they're feeding off what we would consider anxiety symptoms. It's just that they have learnt in their area of expertise to, to channel that. You know, they need that adrenaline to, to carry them through to perform really well. So if we think about it with regards to society, why should that only be the case in sport? You know, why can't we use these responses to really thrive and, and, and fuel off them, like you said, um, for exams or for public speaking or for other stress evoking scenarios? And when we can do that, it's amazing the amount of confidence we, we then do experience and it just completely changes our belief system in terms of whether or not we see that upcoming scenario as being a, a positive thing or a negative thing. And you said anxiety to thrive. I'm wondering, what does it look like in, in your life, if you don't mind me asking? You know, you mentioned, I think, um, that you, you used to be or you, you are an athlete. You know, how do you use all the lessons from, from your research in your own life? Yeah, um, well, I, I really do try and sort of practice what I preach, so to speak, um, you know, a really nice example is, um, you know, when I'm talking to, to teammates, and so I used to play a lot of field hockey, um, and we might have a, a game, a teammate might say to me as we're warming up, you know, I'm feeling nervous today. You know, we're suddenly playing in a knockout game or it's sort of maybe top of the league table or something, clash. They'll say, I'm feeling really nervous today. And immediately I'm like, that's a good thing. And, and they sort of look at me as if I'm absolutely nuts. Um, and I sort of explain, you know, that means you care. That means you want to perform. Your body is clearly thinking today is a more important day. Today I've got to fire that little bit hard. I've got to run that little bit further. Um, and it's just it's just really great to see when when that has a really positive effect on people. Um, and, and myself, when I experience symptoms, I, I remind myself. So, um, you know, I've always loved to play sports and I tend to really thrive off the, the pre-competition feelings of nerves and anxiety. Um, whereas I think, you know, public speaking and things was something that, that never really came easily. And so that was a little bit more of an effort to really think about actually in sport, it does really well for me. I just need to remember that. So using a lot of imagery, I'll often use a lot of imagery to think about scenarios and to help myself feel more confident. And then when I experience those somatic sensations on the, the morning, if I'm, you know, if I was ever having to do a, a big important presentation or whatever, really just feeding off that and reminding myself I'm getting ready, I'm in the zone. And I think when we have um, successful experiences, when we've been nervous, reminding ourselves, oh, good, I'm feeling like I did last time I gave that really big talk and I did really well then. So the, when we have that track record of success, despite feeling nervous, that can also really help solidify in our minds. Yes, these responses equal a good outcome. Um, and so remembering that when we're then in anticipation of a stressful scenario can help us just feel more at ease, feel more confident. Like you said earlier, it comes back to this idea of feeling confident, feeling in control of what we're doing. And again, we're more likely then to experience a more successful outcome in that stressful scenario. Well, I love that. It's always interesting to hear about how researchers, number one, came into their field, but also implement that in their own life. And it sounds like you're still using that in your own um, sports and field hockey. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, I, I just love talking to people about it because you know, we all get stressed, we experience it in everyday life. So if you can actually remind people, and I had a, I had a, um, a chat with a, a colleague the other day, because I talked to them about what I do, and, and they had a friend who was feeling very stressed and nervous and agitated about something. So she got her friend to imagine the scenario and imagine it all going really well and things. And then they went off and did it. And apparently, um, they were successful in doing what they what they didn't want to do at the time. And she was like, it's amazing, it worked. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And it just really reinforces to me um, the stuff that we do, the research studies we do can make a really big difference in, in people's everyday lives. Yeah. So, yeah, already made a difference in my own and I'm, I'm really hoping and anticipating it will for people listening. So thank you for the work that you do, Sarah. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's great. I absolutely love it. I, I just wanted to know if you had anything else um, you wanted to say. You know, you have the floor to listeners. Is there any advice or kind of parting words of wisdom you wanted to, to impart upon listeners? Um, I, I think it really comes back to this idea that um, stress isn't a bad thing. Stress can be very beneficial. Um, and it's about us thinking within ourselves, when have we had times when we have maybe felt some stress or some somatic anxiety symptoms when we've performed well, remembering those times 
and then when we experience responses to stress or experience responses that are anxiety or we consider them to be anxiety really reminding ourselves that this is to help me do well this is to help me either perform well or to meet the demands of whatever it is I'm being asked to do in this upcoming stressful scenario um, trying to remember feelings of confidence and control and really if, if imagery helps you know, visualizing performing well while feeling confident despite those feelings of stress and anxiety because they're really well there to to fuel you to perform really well